As you heard when Mark was sharing, our family has been blessed. Blessed? Yes. Three companies that Mark talked about, but seven companies on the stock exchange in total. And the only person to ever own three sports franchises, major league sports franchises, at the same time. In addition, he has four children. I got to be one of them. I got better as I got older, fortunately. But it's been, a, it's been an incredible, incredible time. I'm not going to talk a lot about, uh, about what he's done. Uh, many of you, being from the Midwest and whatnot, are familiar with my pop or from being down here. But what I want to share with you is a few things that you might not know. One of the things was that when my father proposed to my mother, he was broke. My mom told me that he was so poor, in fact, that he sold his old pickup truck to buy her engagement ring. So he really was a self-starter. Well, he went on to, to grow that company and, and combine it with a company my uncle was running up in Michigan and Chicagoland area to create waste management. Mom would tell me stories of, of dad and, and how driven he was when they were young, and, and he would be driven even now, but especially when he was young, that, that he'd get up early in the morning and he had a part-time helper and they'd drive the garbage truck and pick up the garbage. He'd come home at lunchtime, take a great shower and put on clean clothes and then go out and solicit new business to build the company. And it went on to become very, very successful, the largest waste hauler in the world. He is my pop, but he's also my hero, and I love him very, very much. I worked for waste management all my life. I started when I was 12. I got my first official paycheck from waste management. I tell people that I grew up at the landfill, and everybody laughs at me, and I, but it was true. I, I, I did, and uh, I'd come down and visit my pop, and he was always busy, busy working, so my grandfather would take me, and he worked at the landfill, and he'd drop me off, and I'd ride heavy equipment around all summer long, and I had a ball. I remember being in... Uh, I guess I was young, I was five years old, and my mother went to, we, were, we grew up in the Dutch Reformed Church, and many of you probably know, but for anybody that's not familiar, I like to say that, that you've got the, the Baptists over here, and then the Dutch Reformed were over, over a little further to the right, you know, and any of you that are familiar, you'll appreciate that. And we went to a little church in Pompano, and my mother decided that she was going to divorce my father. Both wonderful people, both, I love them both very, very much, but mom was not happy. And she told me the story that she went to the pastor and she told the pastor and he told her, hey, listen, this is the Dutch Reformed Church, no divorce, you know, it's just not a, not a possibility. She said, I'm very unhappy and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna divorce my husband. And he told her at that time that she could no longer be a part of the church, Real, really kind of kicked her out of the church. And uh, you know, it, it hurt her very, very badly. At a time when she really needed her faith most, uh, she, was, she was kind of disassociated from it. So anybody that's been harmed or hurt by someone from the church, you know what, that's not really God. He loves us all despite our shortcomings. And so I'd like to apologize to anybody that's been hurt by someone with good intentions, but through the church. Unfortunately, as, uh, as dad became more and more successful and I became older, uh, most like most young people, most sons especially, I wanted to follow in my father's footsteps. I wanted to be just like dad. I wanted to, to have the influence that he had and be able to do things for people like he could. I wanted the, the power that he had. I wanted the 1971 split window Riviera that he pulled up at the house with one day, you know, and everybody's, what is that? And, you know, the big boat tail and all. I, I got one of those, but uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, I wanted all the things that he had. And so I went on and as I grew, I, my mom would try to tell me about God and I'd listen, but my mind was really, hey, I want to be like Pop. I went on to college, I got out of college, and uh, actually while I was still in college, he came to see me. And they called up on the dorm phone, you know, no cell phones then, and yeah, hey, your dad's on the phone, and he, yeah, hey, he says, can I come down and see you? I said, sure, Pop, it'd be great to see you. Yeah, great, I'll see you next day, all right, and hung up the phone, and I'm thinking, well, it's too early for grades, he can't have seen those yet, so what, what's, he, what's he coming down for? All right, it'll be fine, don't, don't worry about it. And, I remember we went and we sat on a bench over by the water and he told me that he was retiring from waste management. So I had my, I joke with my wife, I said I had my midlife crisis early on, honey. And uh, because I, like I said, I had worked for waste management all my life and I knew one day that I was gonna work at waste management. And uh, he looked at me and said, what's the matter? I said, well, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And he said, well, you can still work at waste. You know, we still know a lot of people there, son. And I, I looked at him and I said, you know, Pop, but..." It wouldn't be the same because you're not there. And he paused for a second, and then he said, you know, son, we weren't exactly going to work together. 
uh, yeah, I was the CEO, and you were, you know, you were going to be someplace else. And I was like, yeah, I understand that, but, but you were going to be there. And then another year and a half went by, and, and I got out of college. And just after I got out of college, I got involved with Blockbuster Video. And I got to work with him again there, which was wonderful. And, and I bought some of the stock, and the stock went through the roof over 3,000%. Uh, increase over the time that he was involved with the company those eight years and when he sold the Viacom they sold for 8.1 billion dollars which was one of the largest sales, you know stock transaction sales in in the US history needless to say I made a lot of money money that I didn't deserve money that I didn't earn and money that I really didn't know what to do with during that same time I married my childhood sweetheart we had dated when I was 15 and I had two beautiful children. And my mom would come to me and uh, she would say, hey, honey, you know, this is, this is great, no, but, but I'm worried about you. I said, what are you worried about, mom? She said, well, you've got two beautiful children and, 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 the, and the life that we're, you're leading is, is great, but it's really not like the rest of the world lives. And I'm, I'm very concerned about how you're gonna ground your children and, and, and teach them values and all. And I said, all right, well, what do you think? And she said, well, I think you need to start going to church. Uh, I hear you, Mom. All right. And so I you know, kept finding excuses every time she'd bring it up. And I said, well, you know, Mom, I'm, I'm working six days a week and whatnot. And, and then on, on Sunday is really my only day off. And what I didn't have the heart to tell her is I've been out all night on Saturday. And, you know, Sunday morning, the last place I want to be hung over is at church. You know, it's just not something you tell your mother. God had a plan. He kept pursuing me. And one day I got a call from some friends. And uh, he called up and he said, uh, hey, Junior, I've got an opportunity for you. I said, yeah, great. What's up, pal? He said, would you like to go on a fast attack nuclear submarine for three days and cruise from, from South Carolina to Fort Lauderdale? I said, oh, my God, aren't I? Of course. I said, when do we go? He said, tomorrow. I said, short notice, but I'll ask Dad if we can take the plane. Okay, great. And I went aboard and I met Captain Brad Fleetwood McDonald. And he was an incredible gentleman. He gave the, the four of us uh, free reign of the submarine. We went and, and sat in sonar and listened for vessels that might attack us, you know, freighters and fishing boats and whatnot. And, and uh, we had a wonderful time together. And I loved to fish. And I found out that Captain Brad Fleetwood McDonald loved to fish as well. So I thought, well, you took me on your boat that goes underwater, I'll take you on my boat that goes backwards in the water to catch big fish and we'll have fun. And we did. We started spending time together. And every time that we would get together, Captain Brad would bring his Bible. And I asked him about it, because when we weren't catching fish, he was reading or we were playing cards and whatnot. And I said, what's up with, with this? He said, this is the manual for life. Oh, all right, all right. When I was young, this is, probably 18 or 19 years ago now. And I started asking him questions. I thought, boy, I can learn from a guy like this. Anybody that can take 110 young men and put them on a submarine for six months at a time and spend weeks underwater with them and not have chaos, I, I can learn from a gentleman like this. So I started asking him questions about how he led and how he resolved conflict and how he coached and whatnot. And every time I'd ask him a question, he'd turn in his Bible to a chapter and he'd read me some verses. And he'd explain to me what those verses meant and how he used that in his daily life. Wow, all right. It was never pushy, but just would take and would share with me. And after we had been spending time together for a year or two, I started getting very, very selective about who I took with me on the trips because they were special times. Kind of a bittersweet times though, because I recognized in Captain Brad that he was the man that I wanted to be. I had met a lot of incredible people through Wayne Senior, presidents and businessmen and sports figures, but none quite like Captain Brad. He was a sailor, but he didn't drink and swear like I did, and he, he had this peace about him and calm and, and, and that was just beyond anything that I had ever seen. So one day fishing was particularly slow. I think God did that on purpose. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, hey, Captain Brad, 
How do I, how do I be more like you? What, what gives you these special qualities? We're very close. And he looked at me and he smiled, kind of like, hey, I thought you'd never ask, kid, come on. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, well, I have a personal relationship with God. I said, really? Tell, what, what, do you, what do you mean? He said, well, Junior, I believe that you have a hole in your heart. I said, I do? He said, no, 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 no not like a physical hole. He said, have you ever heard that you were created in God's image? And I said, I've, I've heard that, but never quite understood it. He said, all right. He said, well, I believe that God left a, a hole in your heart that could only be filled by him. And he said, well, let me put it this way. He said, have you heard of a black hole? I said, in space? He said, exactly. I said, well, I've seen it on TV. And he said, yeah, and it's, it's this void, and, and it consumes planets and, and everything else, stars and whatnot, get sucked into it. It's got an incredible gravitational pull. He said, that is like the hole that you have in your heart. And he said, you've been trying to fill that hole in your heart with things all these years. You know, big house that you're building and cars and trips. And he said, don't get me wrong, I love the trips. I love going on the boat. But all those things, businesses that you've been trying to create or get involved with, he said, you've been trying to fill that hole in your heart with all those things. And I'm here to tell you that there's only one way to fill that hole. And that's with a personal relationship with God. So I started attending this church, and she was right. Pastor was, was wonderful and, and great, and, and, I, and I, I started going on, on Sundays, and I'd be three rows back on the left. I started dragging my bride with me and, and friends, and soon we had a couple of pews filled up. And if I was in town, you could find me on Sunday at, at church, three rows back on the left. Well, one day, a couple friends came and said, Hey, Junior, you want to go to church with us? I said, Sure. What time on Sunday? They said, No, no, we're going to go tonight. I said, but it's Wednesday night. He said, yeah, our church has, has church on Wednesday night, too. I said, all right, great, great. They said, we'll come by and pick you up. They picked me up, and they drove me to one of the big warehouse churches. And we went in, and it was a little bit uncomfortable. It was a new place for me. And I sat down, and I looked, and there was no hymnals or anything. I said, hey, how do we, do you guys sing here? They said, yeah, yeah, but it'll be up on these big screens. I said, oh, all right, great. They went ahead and they came out, and then we sang songs that I'd never sang before. It was, was really neat. There's, you know, me and 3,000, 3,500 of your closest friends in, in, in this big, big building here and whatnot. And, and the, the pastor came out, and he was incredible. And he spoke for like 45 minutes, almost an hour. And at the end, uh, it was raining outside, really, really a big Florida thunderstorm. And you could hear the thunder inside the building and whatnot. And then the pastor said, you know, if you were to pass away tonight in a car accident with all this weather and whatnot, you know, heaven forbid, he said, please drive carefully, but, but, but just say it was to happen. He said, do you know for certain that you'd go to heaven? And he said, if you don't, he said, you could come forward tonight and you could pray a simple prayer and ask God to come and live in your heart. He said, well, if you don't know, why don't you come forward now? Well, people started standing up in this big church and walking towards the front. Other people around me were clapping and whatnot and big smiles on their face. And I thought, man, they clap in this church. I said, you know, where I go to church, we never clap, even when the choir just kills it. You know, we're sitting there going, that was really good. I want to clap. But you just kind of sat there and smiled like maybe give them a little thumbs up. And uh, that, was, that was about the extent of it. And so I just sat there and the pastor stood around for a couple minutes and the choir was singing. And he came back up. He said, do you think that there's more to being a Christian than going to church on Sunday? I'm sitting there going, I don't know, maybe. And uh, he said, why do you think that God allowed you to be born? He said, I think that God had a plan for your life. He said, why do you think that God gave you the things that he gave you? Ooh, ooh easy there. I've been, I got a lot of stuff. And uh, he said, I think that there's a reason for that as well. He said, in fact, I believe that God wants to have a personal relationship with each one of you, that he's got a plan for your life, and that he wants very much to share it with you. Anybody that would like to hear and meet God and have a personal relationship with him can come forward now, and you can say this little prayer, join these people here, and ask Jesus to come and live in your heart, and he'll begin to show you the plan that he has for your life. It was kind of an uncontrollable thing for me. 
I stood up out of my seat kind of uncontrollably like there was a spring that shot me up. And, 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 I, and I, I reached up and on my lip there was sweat and there was sweat up on my brow. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? And, and I heard this voice that I recognize very well now say, hey, Junior, sit down. Everybody's looking at you, man. But there was no way you could have got me back in that seat. I made my way to the aisle. And, uh, and I walked forward toward the front of this church that I'd never been to before. And a couple of my pals that took me walked up there with me. And the next thing you know, I'd fallen to my knees at the front of this church, and I started to cry. And I don't mean gentleman, man cry. I mean I'm five years old, I've fallen off my bike, my hands and knees are scraped up, and I think I'm going to die cry. Just bawling and telling God that I was sorry. And that if it was true that he wanted to have a personal relationship with me, that I would pray this prayer and that I hoped that he would show me why I'd been blessed with all the things that I had and what I was supposed to do with the rest of my life. I prayed that simple prayer, asked Jesus to come and live in my heart, stood up and turned around to 3,000 people with tears running down my cheek and a full nose. And so while it was a difficult time, it was a special time with a son and a mother. She died one day after her 63rd birthday, 12 years ago. But that wasn't it. A month later, I lost my grandpa, dad's dad. He was a huge part of my life, loved the Lord very much. And I used to go to church with him because I knew if I went, we'd talk about stories of being at the landfill when I was a kid. And I loved that more than anything else because they were special times. But that wasn't it. Shortly thereafter, I lost my cousin Dan. He and I were the same age, and he committed suicide. And shortly thereafter, we, my best friends, uh, we, they lost their, God, their, their child, Fonda and I's godson, Dylan, died from, uh, from heart disease at age two. You see, <laughs> when we talk about God having a plan and his timing being perfect, I really believe it because the old junior, he had borrowed dad's plane, flown somewhere and gotten on the boat and gotten in the bottle. And I wouldn't have been there for my moms. I wouldn't have been there when my brother came in and said, junior, mom's dead. It's all right, pal. She's in heaven. For my children, where's Grammys? She's in heaven, guys. It'll be all right. You'll see her again. For my dad, when he came and said, uh, you know, Junior, you, uh, you did a pretty good job eulogizing your mom. For him, that's like a big compliment. My wife says he packs a tight suitcase. <laughs> he said, uh, do you think you can eulogize Papa? Because I don't think that I can do it. Yeah, Dad, I, I, I got this power. I don't know where it came from, but yeah. For my cousin, when she called us up and said, uh, Dan killed himself. Can you come out and tell his friends why it happened and, 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 and help make sense of this? I said, I can come out and talk to them. I don't know why, but I can tell them what we hope and where I hope that he is. And for our best friends when they lost their two-year-old son. The old junior would have run, but God gave me the power to be a different person. And that's when I realized that it wasn't about how much you had it was about who you had, who you had living in your heart. Don't get me wrong, all of you here are wealthy and it's wonderful to be able to buy nice things and do great things and, and do things for others. And I still do that. I'm still driven in business, but just with a different purpose. I realized then that true wealth was the day that you opened your heart up, asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to live in your heart and you stopped worrying about wealth here on earth and you started building treasures in heaven. We were building a, I was building, my wife would say, a big house, a big, big house. It was the house of my dreams. I used to say ours, but she said, honey, I was happy where we were, a big house that was gonna make me happy. And I finished that house about, uh, about a year before I had this big epiphany in my life. And um, one day, well, about, yeah, around the time that I had this epiphany, I guess, and w there was a wonderful faux painter there 
that was painting the outlets and sockets to look like the wallpaper or marble or whatever was on the walls type of thing. And he was from Brazil, spoke very broken English, and his name is Eduardo. And Eduardo loved the Lord very much. And one morning he came to me, he said, Mr. Wayne, Mr. Wayne, he always called me Mr. Wayne. I think it was just a Latin thing of being respectful. I, I need to talk to you before you go to work. I said, great, Eduardo, come on into my office and we can talk. Okay, great, great. He looked at me and he said, Mr. Wayne, I had a dream about you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Men aren't supposed to dream about men. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> Fortunately, I kept my mouth closed. He said, I, I had this dream a few months ago. And that morning when I woke up, when I was in my quiet time with God, he told me I couldn't tell you. So each day I've been asking, can I tell him today? Can I tell him today? And he, the Lord kept saying, no, you have to wait. And when I was in my quiet time reading my Bible and praying to God this morning, he said, you can tell Junior about the dream today. And he said, so I'm very, very excited. Okay, great. He said, can we pray together so that I make sure and tell you the dream accurately? I said, that, that, I think that would be a great idea. And he went ahead and he prayed for it, that he would be able to share what God had revealed to him. And then he reached in his pocket and he pulled out two quarters. And he handed two quarters to me. He said, Mr. Junior, Mr. Wayne, I, I, I'd like uh, you to take these quarters and then I want you to pretend that I'm Jesus. And I'm going to walk over to the other side of the room here and, uh, and, I, and, and share with you. And I said, all right, great. And he took two or three steps and he looked over his shoulder and he said, but I'm really not, not, not Jesus. And I thought, yeah, I, I got you. Taller, better grasp of the English language. All right, not a problem. <laughs> Again, I kept my mouth shut. He walked over to the other side of the room. He said, Mr. Wayne, would you hold those quarters between your thumb and your forefinger? And I said, like, uh, like this? He said, yeah, that's, that's great, Mr. Wayne. He said, now, will you hold them up in front of your eyes? I said, like this? He said, yeah, just, just like that is great. I said, okay, super. He said, can you still see me? I said, Eduardo, I can see you just fine, my friend, absolutely. He said, now, hold them up against your eyes. I said, against my eyes? He said, yeah, against your eyes. I said, okay, like this. He said, can you see me now? I said, well, no, Eduardo, all I can see is the money. He says, that's the message that God has for you, Mr. Wayne, that as long as you look past the money, the physical wealth that your family has and that you've been blessed with, that you'll be able to hear God and to hear from God. But as soon as you focus on the money, that no longer will you be able to accurately hear him and no longer will he be able to use you. I said, use me? He said, yes. He said, Mr. Wayne, you know, I can, I can talk to another painter, maybe a, a carpenter or a plumber, and, and talk to them about God and, 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 and that he had an, an incredible son, his only son that he sent to this earth to die on the cross after living a perfect, sinless life and die a horrible death. He said, but I could never talk to the people that you could talk to. He said, because of the success that your father's achieved, he said, people will come and listen to you. He pointed over to my credenza. He said, look at all the people that you've been with and taken your picture with that are famous. He said, I could never darken the doorstep, but the Lord will allow you to walk in. So that's how I know that I'm supposed to be here tonight.